Thank you for coming. Today we're going to hear from Dan Powers about his new book, um, Long uh, How Long a Shadow, which um, I have to admit I haven't quite finished, but I'm over two thirds through. And I have to say it's a lot of fun for me because I do family history research and it combines a sort of a mystery detective story with um, family history and um, it's actually classified on Amazon. I don't know if you know this, Dan, as Christian fiction, number I just, one. And, <laughs> I just and heard literary that fiction. through a bookstore that they downloaded it from uh, uh, Ingram, is it? And I contacted them. Actually, Melissa is helping me do that. And I contacted them and said they could change it. And they said, no, it would have to be that. So I've gone back to the publisher this morning and emailed them because it's not Christian. <laughs> I mean, well, one of the does... characters is in the seminary for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and obviously just misleading. I could see getting uh, well, the blasted angle... for calling it Christian when it wasn't. Yeah. The angle I really enjoyed was the family history and how the, char the main character gets um, caught up with um, researching his family. I want to read one line that caught my attention and I can identify with, and I'm sure many others can. He enjoyed the detective nature of the work. There was a tangible pleasure and sense of getting somewhere each time a new piece of information fell into place. His old compulsion for documents and files had returned with a vengeance. And I think... Um, those of us in doing genealogy know that it's like a uh, unfolding detective story. And that's kind of what you've written here in much of the book. Although you span a whole bunch of um, years starting in 19, was it 1918? The first chapter or the beginning, uh, right. not the first chapter, but the beginning of the book. Right. And um, follows the various characters, three generations um, up through to, this current year and the COVID crisis, actually, which is pretty amazing. So Dan, tell us something about this book. Well, it, it started or sprang from the genealogy. I started doing family genealogy in the early 90s. And uh, our family, like so many others, did not share a whole lot of stories. So I didn't know much about the family other than my father was one of 10 children. I knew his mother's grandmother as uh, old grandma powers and had never heard anything about her husband. So we all assumed he'd been dead for ever. Well, as it turns out, I find out he wasn't dead forever. So there was this uh, rogue mysterious grandfather that nobody knew about. In fact, uh, when my parents married in 1937, my mother uh, assumed and thought uh, my dad's father, whose name was Edward, was long dead. He doesn't die till 1954, in fact. So there was the mystery of that. There was the unfolding of the genealogy. And I guess the other part of it that uh, became a stimulus, I didn't realize this was going to become a, a novel at first. I just started keeping notes and writing about the care, uh, family. Uh, but part of me was always thinking, uh, one, I was doing the gene genealogy and then eventually writing the book as kind of a, a salute to the family because uh, I didn't marry till quite old. I was 52, 54 when I married. And in the meantime, and this is, I've been asked this several times, I never have fathered a child. <laughs> um, and if you haven't read the book, when you do, you'll find out why that's, uh, Mm -hmm. becomes a question in there. So, but it became part, uh, in my head, part of a something I could give to the family. I hadn't added physically uh, another human to the family, but being able to add some of the past and then uh, creation of some stories, uh, often kind of based on just little tidbits uh, of information that cousins and whoever had shared. So that's kind of the uh, genesis of where it all came from. And yeah, I had to keep um, a paper copy of the family tree as I was going, <laughs> so I didn't mix up all the characters. And it, mm -hmm. it's really fun because it does um, pull a few surprises on who's actually related to whom and um, the whole thing. But as I say, I really identified with it. Um, 
because I think if anyone's done genealogy, especially these days with DNA, there are all sorts of mysteries that are being revealed. Um, I've had people come in here doing research um, because they found out their relatives are not who they thought they were. And I actually had one girl contact me because she was looking for her father also, kind of the way. Did have you, I know you mentioned DNA in the book, but did you actually do any of that research? Uh, I did, and that was much later that that came about. Um, and actually a couple of quick little stories off of that is having done um, uh, through Ancestry and then doing the DNA, which basically confirmed uh, the basic genealogy that uh, I assumed I had had. Well, one day I get an email out of nowhere from a woman uh, asking me, uh, me if I knew a, and I won't use a first name here, uh, one of the Powers cousins. And uh, I kind of asked why, and as it turns out, she had just, uh, gotten her adoption papers unsealed, her original birth certificate, gave me the name of her mother and said she was looking for her birth parents. And I said, uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> well, as it turns out, it was the daughter of a cousin of mine who had had a, uh, uh, the child young when she was 17 or 18 in Chicago, would have been in the early 60s somewhere and uh, contacted, it was a little bit of an awkward conversation on my part in the beginning. My cousin, who was just super excited, she had been trying to find a way to link up with her daughter, put them in contact and they've been inseparable since. It's been just a wonderful story. So that came from that and I had, a, I won't go into it, but I had kind of a similar story on my mother's side from that. So it is, you get a lot of surprises. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's evolving that way these days, and it's pretty amazing. Um, and some very potent ethical questions are involved, as you sort of point out here. So I think your book is really, um, I haven't really come across anything quite like this yet until this book. And I think it was a great idea to use genealogy. I mean, how many of us have stories we've uncovered that would make great novels? If only we we're all great writers. And I think you do a really good job of writing. It's very readable. and very nicely done. I love the structure. How did you come about at that structure? What of having the dates or the actual dates for each chapter title? Right. Uh, well, there are two th parts to the structure question. Hi, Sandy. Uh, one was when I started to got to the point where I started thinking of trying to turn the information into a novel. Um, I had certain things that I that I enjoy when I read. Certain books I really like parts of or for different reasons. And um, one of them was To Kill a Mockingbird where the story starts down one uh, lane and halfway through shifts to something totally different, much more serious. And it doesn't come, to get in the, uh, come together until the end. Uh, so I had kind of that framework in my head once I started to actually put chapters together. Uh, the other was, uh, as I was writing it, uh, I'd use dates as a way to remember what the heck I had written when, because it was a lot of the genealogy comes from my own family genealogy. It gave me a way of tracking. So originally the entire book, every chapter had dates on it because I didn't know how I wanted to organize it. You know, should I start, tell it backwards to forwards, forwards to backwards, mix it up. Uh, so it was just a way of keeping track of it. And then uh, it became a device in the end when I actually set the final structure that you'll notice some chapters have dates on them, uh, or excuse me, some chapters have dates and titles and then others are just dates. It's a way to help the reader keep track of what's going on and where they are in time and space. So it's just a trick that way. Uh, but then I tried to weave it into the story a little bit that when you get to the end, uh, you kind of find out why some have titles and how that's connected. So you'll have to finish it, Laura, to get to that part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did 
have a peek at the last chapter. So ah, she, she, she. <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> but um, I know from leading book, uh, book discussion groups that people are often confused when you're jumping around in time. And mm -hmm. so this made it so clear because you did go from a more middle year to a past year to a modern year, and it really made it easy to follow what was going on. And um, I kept thinking, well, if only he had included a family tree, that would be great. But then that would sort of undercut your your whole theme, wouldn't it? Well, <laughs> so uh, I had to uh, make my own. <laughs> you're thinking along the same lines of Linda Thompson, who I taught with for years at uh, Sebastopol English teacher, uh, editor of the school paper that won all kinds of awards. And at one point it took uh, a lot of the material to her as I was writing it and she was editing. And she said the same thing. She started a family tree and suggested, highly suggested, that I create a genealogically family tree for the book and put it in the front. Uh, and I thought about it. Uh, and for the same reason you mentioned, decided not to um, just simply because it, in a way, it would give away parts of the story. Um, and you, in, in the book, you talk a lot about Chicago and going to the library there to do research for your family history. And um, you really know the streets and all of the ins and outs of it. Um, I actually lived in the suburbs for 28 years. So I enjoyed that immensely. Mm -hmm. because even if you live downtown, it's fun to uh, see all the little details about where everything is and going through different roads and when they're built. So mm -hmm. you incorporated a lot of history of Chicago. Um, you obviously know it well. Did you grow up there, <laughs> right downtown? Uh, no, I grew up on the far northwest side of Chicago. Uh, and quite a bit of uh, that kind of stuff, like um, there's an early chapter where uh, Kevin is watching the uh, Kennedy Expressway. It wasn't called the Kennedy at the time being built. That's a little bit of a memory in the back of my head. I pedaled my bike down to hearing all this noise and they're digging this hole and putting in the Kennedy. Yeah. So there are all kinds of little bits of memories that became parts of the book. And an, um, another reason for a lot of the history and the being precise with the, uh, uh, the geography it's something I enjoy in other books. When I'm reading something, especially something that takes me back in time, uh, but even if it's current, I really enjoy that kind of stuff, those references. And um, that became, again, I had no idea I was writing a novel to begin with. Uh, but once it started going down that route, I kept thinking of what are the little things that I enjoy when I read? And I kind of, actually thought of this as a practice novel is I'm going to take a lot of that stuff and see if I can do it and just, you know, um, and I hope it worked out. Yeah, it, it did work really well. Um, I w when I first started the book, I happened to, um, I'll compare you to someone who's a really great writer. <laughs> I started watching a, a movie, a Christmas movie, One Christmas, um, based on a story by Truman Capote. And um, I was amazed that the little boy in that was like almost exactly like the boy in your book, <laughs> almost exactly oh, no, no. the same I'll time to, period. I'll have to find I've read that one. And he was off to see his estranged father, so it it was like echoing what you had written there. Um, well, as so many people say, there's nothing new. I, uh, Shakespeare did it first, and then all the rest of us just copy pieces of it and try different things. Um, where did you get the title from? I mean, I came across the word shadow at one point in, in when um, you were talking about the girlfriend of Kevin. Uh, by the way, Kevin is the protagonist, uh, the main character in the book, who um, really covers most of the story. And his girlfriend um, was described as a shadow. Or what did you, where did you get that idea of, uh, for the title specifically? Uh, yeah. The title that ended up there, How Long a Shadow, probably came out in the last month of writing the book. And my earliest drafts go back to 2014. 
I've had probably at least four or five other working titles based on uh, pieces of the story and themes in the story. Uh, for a long time, it was shadow boxing. Uh, shadow was always a, uh, a symbolic metaphor for me throughout the story of the idea of the past. So not in a negative sense, it's just we all carry some of our you know, ancestors with us. And in my mind over time, that developed of this concept of a shadow. So the image of a shadow is used several times through there. The actual title comes out from, I'm trying to think of where it is in the story, but definitely in the last quarter, maybe the last eighth of the story. Uh, and actually the photograph on the uh, front of the cover in, a, in one sentence kind of gets described. And um, that's where the title came from then was how long a shadow, uh, that phrase gets used in there somewhere. Let me pull up um, the a few things that you sent to me. Um, whoops, here we go. Let me, sorry, I have the wrong slide there. But uh, where did you get the idea for this cover? Um, and then, uh, reflecting Chicago and the, is that sure. the? Uh, Outskirts Press, which is the uh, self-publisher I went through, gives multiple options for uh, generic types of covers. So the photograph in the middle with the black on the bottom and the uh, heading up front, the way that's set was one of the options. And I was able to, and one of the reasons I went with that company was they allowed me to play with that idea. The actual photograph uh, is the, uh, the male is I believe my grandfather and I can show you later on the photograph that came from, if I can get it to pop up. Okay. Uh, we don't know. The photograph was found in my grandmother's belongings uh, sometime after she died. My grandmother died in 96. And as it turns out, the grandfather died at 94. And as I mentioned before, the grandfather has never been mentioned in family stories and not even referenced. Uh, so all we could figure out was grandma had 10 kids by one man that nobody knew. Now they were Irish Catholic, so that might explain part of it, but obviously there was some estrangement and weirdness going on. When this photograph showed up, it came to me through an aunt who said, this was in her stuff, I have no idea who it is. And my first reaction was, it was one of uh, my dad's brothers who had died, the only one who didn't survive to adulthood. But then when I looked at the photograph, I said, this is no 14 year old or 13 year old, which is how old um, my dad's brother was when he died. And then it just dawned on me, he said, this has got to be my grandfather. Why would my uh, grandmother have any other? So I cannot swear to it, no one else can. Uh, some cousins have said they see parts of their kids in his face and that kind of stuff, but it, it's there's no documentation that that is, him, but I believe it is. Neat. The um, story centers around and has an L ride in the beginning, and the L is in there a few times. Diversity Avenue um, gets mentioned several times in the book. My father was born on diversity. So I had the image of the guy. I called up a friend who does photography and said, Do you want to play with this? I'm thinking of this idea of the L tracks superimposed with this image. He took it played with it, we went back and forth, editing it till it got to where we wanted. And then I just ran it through filters until it didn't look realistic, it look as you see it now, as opposed to an actual photograph. So it was a combination of themes from the story, potentially the real grandfather, and working with a friend to get the art to where we wanted it. I think it came off really well. Um, I have a couple other things you showed now, what is this? Or that you sent me. What is this? Opinion? Okay. Um, as uh, you and uh, Tom there and anyone else who has done genealogy is uh, wealth and knowledge starts to come together when you start to get into the census documents. And uh, this is one, and let's see if I can see it up there, 1870. 
at that point, my great grandmother uh, was remarried. My great grandfather had died. And I knew uh, from a burial record, she had married a guy named O'Rourke. Nobody in the family knew about this. And this was a census document uh, that just kind of showed from, like I said, the 1870 census, interest-wise. But the uh, top there, O'Rourke is the name, and then all the other names under it. Well, all of the names other than um, uh, Nicholas O'Rourke are actually Powers's. And uh, in this particular census, all of the names, these were all living with the stepfather at that point. So it's just a curiosity as far as the census document, mm -hmm. the kinds of information you got out of this and what it meant as far as a life. Nobody knew this great grandmother um, had remarried. I mean, nobody in my generation or uh, my dad's generation never mentioned it. Okay, and who is this young man? Okay, Jimmy 1917 plays a part in the book. Uh, after an opening in the book, uh, several chapters are about Jimmy. And Jimmy is actually my father and is based on him. And uh, this actual photograph, which came from my grandmother's stuff again, um, is a photograph of my father in 1917. My father was born in 1908. Uh, being Irish Catholics males, uh, reticent to marry, I guess, um, they were all much older. Uh, my great grand, no, I take it back. My grandfather was actually born in 1863 in the middle of the Civil War. My dad is born in 1908. And this is his picture when he was uh, nine years old in 1917. Oops, sorry. A lot of the little images or scenes or details in the book come from actually artifacts that I came across in my genealogy work, this photograph being one of them. And again, I don't wanna give, a, uh, for me to talk too much about it would give away uh, a lot of the book, uh, but they became real important in both uh, uh, spawning ideas of what to write about and uh, details and just, you know, it, they became, a big part of the book, and I'll, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, and what is this document that you sent? Okay, this one is um, one of the two that started this whole shenanigans on my part. This is a burial record from Calvary Cemetery. And if you can see up at the upper left hand corner, uh, it was purchased by a Richard Buckley. That was my grandmother's father. And the date is 1868, 69, I can't read it. 68, I okay. think. When um, my grandmother died, she was buried at Calvary. And then when a cousin, a uh, mother, an aunt by marriage died, she was buried at Calvary and that's all I knew about it. That cousin later, to make a long story short, gave me found out I was interested in genealogy and shared this. I went from knowing four ancestors on my dad's side, his mother, um, the names of the great grandparents, um, and that was it. This is a burial record from Calvary for a single plot, 16 by 10. And I forget which one is which, but there were approximately 22 bodies in that 16 by 10 plot going back to 1868. So I went from knowing four people having four names to all of a sudden having 22 or 18, whatever's on here. I went back to Calvary and said, I gave them another set of names. They came up with another similar document a, excuse me, 16 by 10 plot with an equal amount of names. So all of a sudden, when I got into the genealogy, I had 40 plus names of people, almost all of whom I had never heard of before. 
So then I started piecing things together. Who's who, what's the relationships? A lot of them I still don't know. A lot of them are, I assume actually uh, neighbors, children of neighbors uh, that get buried there. Uh, you know, that they didn't have their own graves that they buried them there. So that really sparked my interest in genealogy all, uh, and, and the mystery detective work. Who the heck are all these people? And what was this last one that you sent? Uh, that's the other one I just mentioned. Uh, okay. This was uh, Jane Powers at the top would have been my great grandmother. And uh, she at the same time, 1868-1869, bought a plot out of Calvary. Again, I don't want to give it away because it's part of the history of Chicago, but for a reason that's actually uh, described in the book, Lots of Irish Catholics and others were moved out to a, a variety of other cemeteries in Calvary, which if you know Chicago is just across the border on the lake of, into Evanston, was a brand new Catholic cemetery. And um, so uh, that's where a, a lot of them ended up being buried. But the, the two families had two plots out there and all of those bones are in there. Um, let's see. Do you have another book in mind then? Are you going to carry on with any of the characters from this one? It seems that I, I, I probably should have been asked that several times, uh, but no, I have started another book, but totally different. Uh, and uh, I don't know what else I could add to this one, uh, particularly since the reason I wrote it was to uh, kind of in my head, consolidate things I knew about our family. Uh, so parts of the genealogy are tired. Uh, tr well, the genealogy is accurate. A lot of the images are just fragments of childhood memories. All dialogue scenes and all of that is all fictionalized. So whatever anybody says in there, I made it all up. Now you were you were a teacher and a retired teacher, and the um, main character Kevin was also a retired teacher. He was a music teacher. Um, do you think your teaching influenced the way you wrote, or uh, made a difference in how your book was put together? Uh, yes, and actually in a few ways. Um, originally, when I got into teaching, it wasn't music, and with no talent and it. 10 year, I became enamored with music. Um, I actually ended up with, uh, and I may be the only person you ever know who has a master's in musical composition and is basically tone deaf. But uh, I mean, I can't even sing happy birthday in one key. So, <laughs> but I was, I was interested in it, music theory. So I, I had that interest in and I taught beginning music lessons and general music. So there was that. The musical composition got me interested in creativity and uh, composition and the idea of creation, uh, creating things. And that's always stuck with me. And as I started to write the book and uh, didn't really have an idea of where this was gonna go, was it gonna be a book? Uh, was it gonna be a novel? all of that, I, I found myself often thinking as I tried to pull it together in terms of music, musical structure rather than uh, literary structure. So uh, I could make a strained argument that the book is actually a sonata uh, and I won't go into all of that, but the way a sonata is put together uh, with a, a little bit of a prelude, a little bit of coda at the end, but uh, that was kind of the structure. So yes, it actually did play into how the book came together and how I thought about it in the beginning. Interesting. Um, you mentioned something about how you uh, published the book and the cover, but can you tell us more about how you approached that? So many people these days are interested in writing books and being published. Right. Uh, we retire, we gotta find something to do, right? <laughs> so it, uh, it's a time to, um, it, it was, 
a bucket list thing of trying to do something like this. Uh, I taught, uh, I was a literacy specialist for a big part of my career and at the end. And uh, so I work with teachers on how to teach reading and writing as writing became more important in the curriculum. Uh, did a lot of work with the kids, obviously, in doing that. And um, I wanted to play with the idea of writing fiction. I, I, and this is not uh, being self facing I can't tell a joke. I forget the endings all the time or give it away in the beginning. So I thought, okay, if I could get a musical composition masters with a tin ear, can I write a novel when I can't tell a joke? So it became a challenge to go after it that way. Uh, the publishing, um, I started looking around when I started to get serious and got closer to the end. A, a good friend, Rudy Sonarigi, whom a lot of you know, uh, has had written and I'd read some of his stuff, memoirs on fishing. And actually I just finished last night, his newest one on his, uh, from his journal to going to Alaska. And I talked with him about it. And I started looking online for other ideas. And there were cheaper methods of doing, getting a book printed. Uh, Outskirts Press, who I found, and then tried to get, make sure I was getting ripped off because I'm paranoid, I always feel you do anything online, you're taking your, uh, have the chance of throwing your money away. So I did some research on them and uh, they were very good. But they allowed a lot of different choices of things that, uh, which obviously cost a little more. In the end, uh, I had choices of uh, fonts and the text and the layouts and the cover and what goes on it. And then they put it on Kindle, they put it on Amazon, they put it on, uh, uh, I'm blanking on uh, what I just said, uh, the company the, that distributes them. Mm -hmm. uh, where book buyers buy their books and they're the ones somehow got the Christian thing in there. Uh, but this company did all of this and I am not technologically savvy. And at the time I hadn't thought about looking up Melissa to get me through all of this. Um, so they did all of that. And to me, that was worth you know, paying to have somebody else who knew what they were doing, get that all posted out there. And it's all worked. As soon as it uh, came out, I forced my wife, Joan, I didn't force her, but I nagged her, uh, who had not read anything on the book as we went, as I went through it. Uh, she had to buy the Kindle. She reads on Kindle. And I said, I gotta know if it works. <laughs> you know, we, so she did that. I bought one copy for myself through Amazon to make sure it was legit. Uh, if I had to do all that stuff, I'd still be thinking about it. So it was nice and this company allowed me to do that. So that's why I went with them and have been satisfied. Well, that's interesting to hear. Um, you said you have some other photographs to show us. Would you like to share those? Uh, yeah, now you'll have to really, give me a moment here. Uh, you got that. Uh, I go. mentioned before that uh, in my grandmother's belonging, uh, that photograph you saw of my supposed grandfather, uh, this is my grandmother and we assume she was about 1820 at the time. And uh, none of us cousins had ever seen, grandma was always short, round, very round, white hair, granny glasses. Uh, and no one, none of us ever thought of her as children often dealt of. She was a beautiful woman in her day and she would have been born about 1888. Um, I'm not good with looking at the outfits and trying to decide uh, years, but I know enough that that's, you know, in that ballpark or, or uh, turn of the century about there. So we guessed her to be about 1820 at that point. And that was there alongside this other picture of the guy you saw before, which even if it's not true, that became the gist of the story. This has got to be the grandfather. Now I have the two of them as young people. And um, grandma here, I knew she would never ever talk about her family genealogy and would never 
uh, other than uh, giving his name once to a cousin who was in tears because she needed to make a family tree for a uh, social studies class, gave, uh, finally gave out the names. Uh, so we never knew what the estrangement was about or any of that. So that also was part of the uh, enticement in writing the book of trying to make up my own story about it, what happened there. And just what was that like as they went through uh, that? Let me see if I have another one here. This is one, I do not know for sure who these folks are, but again, it came through and I'm not even remember from where, but down in the family somewhere. My guess is this is actually the great grandmother. Uh, you saw the uh, Calvary, uh, the burial record, Jane Powers on that, her original name. Uh, and she immigrated from uh, uh, Wexford County, Ireland. Uh, and her maiden name was uh, Jane uh, Shields. And I am assuming just based on, you know, the image itself that that is who this is. I have no idea. This character shows up briefly in the book. Uh, I have no idea who the young boy is. And I can't place it other than you can kind of tell from the brick and it appears to be close. That definitely seems to be a city setting. Uh, so that's what I had on that one. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, th th those are the family members who all get tossed into the mix in the story. They all make appearances in there somewhere under a pseudonym, but don't tell anybody that. Does anyone in the audience have a question or something you'd like to bring up? You'd have to unmute yourself um, to speak up. Yes. Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> okay. um, did you? Well, I guess I do. When you did the genealogy, did you? use any of the uh, like ancestry and family search or any of that information or did you do did you just use your artifacts that were given to you uh, when I started this in the early 90s um, I I'm not even sure the schools had computers at that point mm. uh, or not much of them so yeah um, I didn't, the original was, I got this initial information, then a cousin gave me one of those burial records. And I did literally in the nineties, it's uh, the dates are changed in the book. I have a scene going down to the Newberry Library in Chicago and um, okay. did that. And that's, that's where true, I yeah. picked up a lot of the information. I still remember I gave myself a few days uh, spent half a day getting nowhere. And then all of a sudden it was like you just shook a tree and stuff started, information started falling out. Names and it run from one section over to the uh, uh, microfiche and get census documents yeah. and get all these other names. So that's yeah, where it started. Were. Later on, I did start to use Ancestry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, being by Newberry, you were, <laughs> you, you were definitely lucky. <laughs> Yeah, that you were yeah that you were close to Newberry because that's a good source. And it, uh, like I say, it does become a uh, a scene in the in the book of that journey, and um, mm -hmm. uh, it was exciting. You know, that is the detective part here. You know, you, you feel right, like you're right. close. Yeah. The uh, uh, just the whole sense of that you're trying to and all of a sudden getting closer to touching the past, your own past, as well as uh, other people's past and the city's past. One of the reasons I used um, as much history in the book as I did, one, I liked that in other books, but I wanted to try to create, and I don't think I was overly successful in this, but I wanted Chicago of um, Victorian Chicago, early 20th century Chicago to kind of be part of the uh, a character in the book or at least influencing other characters and i think were you, you able to go that. were you able to go to in, well since you grew up there you probably went to some but did you go back 
to any of the addresses of the oldest or earliest ancestors? Did you go back to those? Or maybe you had already been there, I, I'm uh, not sure. I hadn't, the genealogy got me interested, but it was uh, much later and I'm not gonna remember the sequence and I don't wanna waste your time while I try to figure out exactly when, but again, in the book, there are some scenes to that of, uh, as, as you get into this, as you know, you get addresses. Uh, what's really interesting now, and is it uh, Zillow? That's the real estate. Uh, I mean, you can go online and stick in an address, and I did, that uh, one of the houses that's referenced in the books, uh, actually a couple of them, uh, you can go on, and I found images with, of, the, of the building and what they sell for now, and, Damn it, I wish I had bought them way back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't we all? <laughs> but it's just amazing, again, online, being able to, uh, what you can do, uh, mm -hmm. go back and see them. I had some older pictures and to see modern pictures with them, but I did, and it's kind of explained in the book of, again, you're searching for these shadows or searching in the shadow for these ghosts and trying to feel a connection, find a connection. So. Sure. I did do that both in the book and in real life. Hmm. Great. Do you know where your families came from in Ireland exactly? Uh, Wexford County, and Wexford. I've got that on a um, a, uh, a death certificate by the next generation uh, who would witness for the death had them there. I have some, um, I've got a ship manifest that has both names, but they are separated mm -hmm. and with different people. Mm -hmm. He too, which is when by a couple of sources, I believe they've got here. But again, I've got no corroboration that those are actually the, the right two people. My nephew, mm -hmm. bless him, uh, who's much more of a genealogical mutt than I am, uh, has decided he's Irish. And he's <laughs> written for the Irish paper. He's been to Ireland probably a dozen and a half times. When he got married, they went over there to get married. After my brother died, he hounded me until I started to realize what a jerk I was being. He wanted me to go to Ireland with him, and I finally did. Oh. And we were able to trace uh, from, um, uh, went to Wexford, got lucky, and found uh, the Wexford Library, somebody who gave us some possible leads based on the information I had, uh, over to the uh, southwest corner of Wexford where it borders Waterford. And the name Power Powers comes from that area. There's a lot of them there. Not many shields, which was my great grandmother and we got over there and that's the name I had. So again, to make a long story short, we found the area where there is a good chance that uh, they came from. But we do know it was Wexford County and that is about 1852 when the two of the great grandparents uh, emigrated over here. Hmm. Any other questions? Katie, hey. Kathy? Hi, I don't have a question as much as a thank you. I love the book. I'm also from Chicago, uh, South Side, not North Side, but uh, your references to the city, the, the historical, uh, aspects uh, just drew me in. Um, they certainly worked with the story. Um, as it would happen, um, third generation Irish Catholic. My grandparents emigrated in the late, in the early 1900s. Uh, we knew a lot about grandma, not so much about grandpa. So watching that, that information flow, um, started me wondering if I shouldn't uh, spend some more time with genealogy. Um, but then and near the end with the Cubs World Series, um, my father was a lifelong Cubs fan and they won the series on his birthday. Oh, really? He, nice. had passed, he had passed the year before, so uh, all of us were, <clears throat> were on our phones, you know, come on Pops, you know, you pull your strings now, you're where you can make it happen, and so it, it just, 
it tied it all together. I love the book. If you're going to be a Cubs fan, you have to just <laughs> <laughs> hope like that. So the fact that it actually happened. And actually, that was interesting. Um, Cubs initially get mentioned. Uh, I grew up a Cubs fan, and I knew my uh, father had been. So a draft of a chapter from probably 2014, 2015 mentions the Cubs. 19, uh, I, that's when I originally wrote it, but it's uh, early in the 1918. And so that, that was it. It was just a, a city reference. Well, the book took so long to write, which allowed me to get up to both COVID-19, got through the Cubs winning the series. So the Cubs just became part of that uh, family tug, uh, the city lore. And then in the end, I wanted to experiment and see if I could carry on two things in a chapter at the same time. And one is a Cubs series and one a family fight, argument, discussion. And how do writers do that? How do you make it not sound like you're just doing a news report about a game on TV and yet keep the characters alive and involved and bounce back and forth? So uh, that was fun to play with and again, I think it came out moderately successful, uh, th that duality, but it was uh, an experiment. Like I said, it was a practice novel. Can I pull this off and do two, th you know, chew and walk gum at the, uh, uh, chew gum and walk at the same time? I can't say it at the same time, obviously, but uh, <laughs> uh, so that was part of it, but it was, it was fun to do and it took a long time to get it to kind of work and I hope it came across. Mr. I P, I have a couple questions. <laughs> Absolutely, I've been waiting for hers. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm I'm Mel. I'm a, a former student of Mr. I always call him Mr. P, so I apologize. Of Dan, seems weird to call you Dan, um, but Dan was my gifted and talented teacher for a long time, um, and he is uh, probably the reason why I am a writer today uh, for my full time job. So Very I have sure. a couple uh, details that I wanted to commend you on, but then I have a question. <laughs> Um, the first is that I love Kevin's wife's name in the book. Um, Nelson is very unique. And I loved, um, without giving too much away, I, I love that Nelson played a part in the book more at, I mean, she was definitely part of the book during the course of the book, but she had kind of this, um, this coda, so to speak, um, on the book. Um, and I thought that was very cool. Um, I guess my question is, um, I really want to talk about Thomas, who's, you know, a pretty central character in the book. Um, I wanted to know if you had a friend like Thomas, if he was based on somebody um, in real life. Um, and also just a comment that when you are a student of somebody um, and you are eight or nine years old and, and, you know, interacting with them, you have no clue that they might have this history that you have no concept of. Um, and so I didn't realize that, you know, you were probably in your late teens, early twenties when Vietnam was, I mean, Vietnam obviously was a long, a long thing. Um, the book has a lot to say about Vietnam um, or not a lot to say, but the, you know, the central character, one of the central characters played a big role. Um, so I guess like, I wanted to know about Thomas and, and kind of the, um, the idea behind that character and kind of if, if that person was someone from, from your history personally. Um, thank you. First, I want to clarify when uh, Mel mentioned gifted and talented teacher, that is not an adjective of the teacher, but the <laughs> students with whom he worked. That's and Mel true. definitely <laughs> fell into that category. Uh, Thomas came out of as far as I remember, when I was in elementary school and I went to a Catholic uh, grades one through eight uh, elementary school, of my people in my circle, there was one student who did not have a father. His father is dead. That's where that started. Uh, his name wasn't Thomas. We weren't particularly close friends. Um, but again, in the writing, at least the way I write, I end up starting things and I throw in a detail and all of a sudden that detail says, hmm, and I start running with that and see what happens. I am not someone who can plan out what's gonna happen here and know what's gonna happen on the last page. So 
that just character just kept growing. Um, brought in, I liked to draw when I was a kid, brought that in. Uh, so that's how he started to come alive. I did not have a friend. Uh, I did get drafted when I was 18. I didn't know that. And uh, ended up with a 4F. Uh, I always had in the back of my head, I've had asthma since I was a student or a sec, uh, two years old. And it was a type that both between colds and whatever, and uh, they now call it uh, exercise induced asthma. I figured I would last about 47 minutes in boot camp before they'd say, how the hell did you get in here? You're out. So I always felt kind of safe, but eventually they did take a doctor's uh, referral and I ended up four up. Uh, I didn't even have any close friends in Vietnam, uh, acquaintances, but nobody close. But it was just such a central part of that growing up and, uh, and starting to uh, make, become aware of more morality and ethics and choices and blah, 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 and all of that and how it affected. So it just seemed like a, uh, I had no intention on uh, again, I don't want to give things away. I had no idea what was going to happen with Thomas. I had no idea Thomas was going to have a sister when it started. Uh, when it started, so that's just the way I write. Each thing came out of that, one after another, and after it builds up enough, there is enough material there to start to focus in on a storyline. Interesting. Does anyone else have a question? Sandy. Is it an audio book or might it be? Uh, I certainly wouldn't try to read it. Uh, I do not have a speaking voice and I don't, uh, and I've never been particularly good uh, reading to kids or anything like that. So I wouldn't uh, do it. So I, I guess at this point, uh, most likely it'll just stay in Kenya. You can get an electronic version, but unless you're offering, Sandy, I mean, if somebody wants to read it, <laughs> we'll go with it, but uh, no, I wouldn't do that. Any other questions? If not, um, I'd like to say thank you all for coming and thank you, Dan. That was really interesting. I enjoyed the book. Thank you very much. Thank and you. We, we do have it in the library, but I'm sure you can also buy it on Amazon and in the local bookstores. Right, and I really am promoting uh, uh, Novel Bay here in town. You can buy it uh, physically there or uh, order it through them. And uh, just trying to, you know, they've been very helpful, very supportive. So if you're about and looking or even ordering it online, be it in Florida or wherever, uh, actually I just had a Facebook connection the other day from somebody I didn't really know, but who is, a well-known name here who's now in California saying they were going to buy it through them and said, great, because that will uh, that will really give me credence if somebody with a name in California is ordering my book <laughs> from Door <laughs> County. So, <laughs> Are you okay. writing another one? Are you I writing am. another book? Uh, I've uh, started drafting characters. Uh, at this point, all I know is it's going to have a school setting since that's where I spent my life. Um, I've got ideas for characters. I've been starting to sketch them out. Uh, and I know the bottom line of it is that I hope to capture the reality of what a school, what goes on in the school and the people in the school. Mel kind of referenced this of, um, as students and as parents, unless you're in a school district working there, you go in there are all these people, they do their thing, you like them, you don't like them, but you really don't have an idea of uh, the humanity and all of the things that are behind the scenes and the people and the variety, diversity, uh, the things that schools do well and the, and the things we still suck at. And I still consider myself in that position. Um, and making realistic characters from a lot of different venues. So uh, I don't know, I've got 20 some pages of you know, notes and starting to sketch characters. 
And each time I do, as I said before, I put down one thing and all of a sudden start spinning off of, well, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. So uh, Tom, check with me in another six years at the pace I go. <laughs> if if okay. we are both still alive. <laughs> we about well, that. Six years, I'll be able to read. <laughs> <laughs> Like my cataract surgery uh, <laughs> schedule already. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Dan. Laura, thank you for inviting me. This has been a pleasure. And thanks to all of you. And Tom, I hope to get to see you here. And Jane, I'll just have to come down the floor and see you and, and the others I do see. So thank you for coming. Thanks. Bye-bye.